Here's how I describe One Piece so far, right? It is the story of a kid who's going on this like naive adventure full of expectations without any assumptions. Uh, up till now, it's been stated, at least by Zoro, that they have been practically playing pretend pirates. Yeah, sure, they do a lot of one-on-one -on -one fighting against like bigger organizations or people, but they haven't taken themselves seriously. And then the Water 7 saga happens. So if Water 7 is like seeing the collapse of the crew, then Ennis Lobby is the realization of their mistakes and post Ennis Lobby is finally accepting and growing from that mistake. Usopp, despite him carrying a lot of weight back in Ennis Lobby, can't just be let back in like nothing happened. Zoro can't allow that to occur because we're not just gonna wait for something like this to happen again. This is going to be the new standard. Understanding that like Luffy has final say and that he is the captain that has to be what the official serious crew establishes because now that they're in a conflict with the world government things are only going to get harder from here and everybody needs to be on the same page okay and i preface all of that because the death of the going mary is so thematically resonant it is both like the death of this character that we have been with for over 400 chapters along with the metaphorical death of this crew who plays pretend. And the fact that she is somehow connected to this overarching narrative is, is wild to me. Sure, now the Going Mary is quite literally a character, but before we got to see the Going Mary talk, she was still like a character with emotions and willpower and things she wanted to do. And yet, the Going Mary, like the crew, was not prepared for the tough situations that they would have to go up against. And this is where I think like the Thousand Sunny comes in. The Going Mary had the idea of wanting to traverse around the world and keep the Straw Hat safe. And even though she couldn't do that, now we see that dream passed along and embodied within the Thousand Sunny. We're also kind of getting shown that even though the Thousand Sunny is like the next leap where the crew officially becomes a crew, it doesn't mean that we have to take everything seriously. The name The Thousand Sunny was itself a joke within the narrative of One Piece, even if I think there's just so much, so much more meaning behind it. So, so let's jump into that. I, I chose to focus on Robin and the world government and the Straw Hats for my review of Venice Lobby, but that means I didn't talk about all of the themes of Venice Lobby, which is good because it connects to post Venice Lobby and the themes go deep. And that theme is the theme of darkness and self-proclaimed gods. Okay, <clears throat> so in Ennis Lobby, the world government is described as the darkness of the world. Even Rob Lucci means to steal the light and you can't get any more obvious than that. And while up to now, I think that we've seen the Straw Hats either fight against small fish or small organizations, this is the first time we're seeing them go up against the world and its darkness as it tries to steal the light. Next in this theory is like the going Mary, which I interpreted as like a fun pun to being like Mary go round the world. And of course she uh, didn't get a chance to fully do that, but her will lives on through the thousand sunny. As Mr. Iceberg mentioned, it's a nice sun. The thousand sunny will sail through the dangers of the thousand seas, shining happily like the sun. So now we have some interesting themes that we're building. The thousand sunny, who is a literal sun, and the straw hats along with it, which are the light who will battle against the world's darkness. The world's darkness isn't just like Rob Lucci or the Navy, but like any self-proclaimed god or ruler who attempts to deal out their idea of justice. Like Back in Skypea, Enel, in the end, created a darkness which Luffy quite literally had to break through to show the light. So I think the Straw Hats will fight against the world government and any self-proclaimed god that tries to deal out justice. And it looks like it's kind of building towards one of these types of fights with how much it's emphasizing Blackbeard in this arc. Blackbeard getting the fruit that allows him to literally create a black hole, a quite literal darkness, versus Ace who creates the light in the form of fire. And the reason why I'm saying that Blackbeard is a pivotal villain is because we've seen how much we've been building up Blackbeard's villainy for like over 200 chapters. For example, Whitebeard is against Blackbeard for seemingly killing one of Whitebeard's crewmates and Ace is responsible for getting Blackbeard. We also have Shanks that has been attacked firsthand by Blackbeard. So this is probably like the first time that I can think of in this story where I think we've been building up for like a fight like 
this, where it's not just going to be a one-on-one personal conflict, but rather where multiple characters like Ace and Shanks and Whitebeard, and I could even see Luffy going after them, all come together to fight Blackbeard. I hope that makes sense. I just wanted to cover the like huge amount of like light versus dark themes in the story and just wanted to get that out of the way first because I thought that was so fascinating. The weird part right now is that Blackbeard is fighting Ace already, but I don't think it's going to end here because of all the themes that we've been building up so far. It would kind of be like anticlimactic if like Ace just kills Blackbeard off screen. <gasps> he would like arrest him and then they would like go back to like Whitebeard and then Blackbeard would be like, aha, it's a trap and then kills everyone there or something or wants to. And then they like fight over there. You know, they fight on Whitebeard ship and Luffy is somehow there too. I don't know. It just felt like we were waiting for the end of Ennis Lobby to finally be able to put a lot of these things out there because Shanks was mentioned to be traveling to Whitebeard for who knows how long, but we haven't seen them actually get there until now. It just also makes it feel like the Grand Line is so much bigger if Shanks says, hey, let's go meet up Whitebeard. And then we get so much time in between where he is presumably still traveling to Whitebeard, still just taking him a long time to get there. And when he does get to Whitebeard, we get the power move that is hockey. I love that like some of the crew members are like, yo, you should really get out of here before you collapse. And then some of the other guys are like, what are you talking about? I'm not going to collapse. And then they just fall over. That's a cool power move. I think it's the first time that I really see just like how powerful Shanks can be. And we're going to see a lot more of that in a second. But just trying to connect this uh, back to the themes of darkness. Here's where we see Shanks trying to warn Whitebeard of how dangerous Blackbeard can be. Black Blackbeard is the one that gave Shanks a scar on his face and then stuff just connects. This is where I'm like, oh, this isn't just like an ace thing. This isn't like an ace versus Blackbeard thing. If Shanks is coming over here, then stuff is gonna get serious. But of course, like, why is he here, here? Was there a situation where, like, Shanks saw Ace the same way he saw Luffy? Like, Shanks used to carry around a cowboy hat and then saw Ace and was like, ah, yes, return this to me, and gave Ace his cowboy hat? So then Shanks had to be like, well, now I need a new hat. So he got a straw hat. And then Luffy came along. So he was like, ah, return this to me one day. And gives his straw hat to Luffy and... <laughs> This is really dumb. I just like the idea that like Shanks just does this. He gives random hats to people and then puts on a new hat. And like he doesn't wear one anymore because he's constantly just giving away his hat. So the reason why he doesn't currently have a hat on is just because he keeps giving people his hat. Right, sorry, things were supposed to get serious. Whitebeard just ignores whatever Shanks said and then they clash, literally opening up the clouds. This shot looks beautiful in the manga, by the way, and it's very depressing in the anime. I went to look at it because I'm like, this is going to be cool. And then you go look at it and it's like a noise texture. I just didn't think it did the scene justice, which is a shame because I think it's very cool. The clouds literally split in half. All right. Anyways, on the other side of the world, we're reintroduced to Kobe, Garp, and, uh, well, Helmut was there too, I guess. It's why I say that post Ennis Lobby feels like we were just waiting to talk about so many things. And now we have time. Now we can show Kobe and Garp. So, le so let's do that. It's been like 400 chapters and they're still relevant because they're not too far behind the crew and they've been training to also get stronger. But like Kobe and Garp were so important. And also there's Elmo Bo too, I guess. And he got a glow up. One of them, not, not Helmo Bo. I think he's still kind of weird looking. But Kobe though, look at that glow up. I didn't even recognize him. But Kobe, Kobe is the catalyst for all of the info dump here that we get. It's also where we learn about the second half of the Grand Line, which is called the New World. And one, that's very beautiful. But two, it's very metaphorically resonant. If Ennis Lobby is creating this battle between good versus bad, light versus darkness, where the Straw Hats are fighting to change the world, then it makes sense that they have to go to the New World world. 
where they will create a new world. Okay, okay, is that why it's called that? Is like everyone in the new world just trying to create a new world? Or is it just like the, the Thousand Sunny where, oh, that's just its name. It totally doesn't have a deeper message behind it, even though it totally does. I don't know. Again, I still have a lot of questions. And again, the broad strokes are easier to understand than the specific. There were a lot of questions I had in Ennis Lobby and post Ennis Lobby gave me a lot of answers, but it somehow also managed to give me even more questions. For example, in NS Lobby, I was wondering how in the world the Navy was capable of traversing places with the Sea Kings. And then in post NS Lobby, we essentially learned that the sea prisms can mimic the ocean, which opens up just a ton of possibilities around how trade is conducted in this world. Like before then I was thinking like, okay, maybe fishmen can go through the comm belt. Now we know that like the Navy can go through the comm belt. And of course, uh, uh, really strong pirates like Frankie or Noland used to do that all the time while they were in the Grand Line. Post Ennis Lobby is just like, hold on a brief second, we got more lore to dump on ya, and just casually drops the fact that Garp is Luffy's grandson. Like what? Just out of nowhere? You're just throwing me this curveball? Like right now? That someone in the Navy is related to Luffy? We haven't even stopped to catch our breath since last time, okay? First, I'm putting up everyone who I think is related to Luffy, meaning like anyone who has like that D initial. Some are like very vague on the timeline and some are way Way stronger, like Ace and Luffy are Dragon Son. I originally thought they were like Roger Son, because that was the only person who had like the gold D initial. But then we get like Saul and Rogers and Blackbeard who all have the D initial, so somehow they are related to Luffy. I also wanted to touch upon the fact that like even though Garp and Kobe and Helmetho and Aokiji are bad in the sense that they are against the Straw Hats, at least uh, from a surface standpoint. I find it interesting that Garp, when forced to go back and capture the Straw Hats, seemingly is throwing his punches. And it's fascinating to me because all of these people who are in the Navy, like Garp and Aokiji and Kobe, are technically kind of uh, an ally in the sense that when the Straw Hats leave, Garp and Aokiji don't look angry. Both of them look relieved. Aokiji even stating like, yep, I saw the Straw Hats escape. Check the check mark. Uh, we're done here. Let's not go after them. We're done. But they don't pose a direct conflict to the Straw Hats the same way someone like the world government or Blackbeard does. But Garp isn't even mad that the Straw Hats managed to escape via this like huge engine behind the Thousand Sunny, which beautifully incorporates Frankie as part of the Straw Hats. Kind of like he knew he was going to join. But it's great that he actually comes along because I was worried uh, about how they were going to be able to make Frankie come along because he is with the Frankie family, which seemingly would make it difficult for him to just be like, all right, guys, I'm leaving on this ship and you guys are coming with me. But it makes a lot more sense when it's like the Frankie family that wants to let him go because his bounty is just so high and it would endanger everyone here. And if the Navy came back, they're not sure they could get Frankie back, which is uh, like a pretty pretty good transition into bounties as a whole. Here we get like Nami's village where people are seemingly like totally upset that she's a pirate, but also really proud of her. Or whether it's Chopper's small bounty, which is just <laughs> hilarious. He didn't even get like a triple digit bounty, but Kuriha is still really proud of him. For Usopp, it's a nice way to connect back to Sarah village in part because it's just so connected to the saga. And bounties are just like a good design metric to establish a character dynamic. It's how we see Kaya's reaction to Usopp or uh, how the entirety of the Baratier is just utterly proud of Sanji. Even Sanji himself also isn't excited about the picture. I mean, I also wouldn't be excited about that picture. But the picture doesn't matter. It's just the fact that it even exists that matters. Like Sanji got a bounty and the entire chef crew saw it and were proud of him. Even boasting like, ah yes, a famous pirate, the one who fought against the world government and won, was from here, originated in Baratier. You can feel the like excitement and proudness that everyone feels upon seeing these bounties. If anything, because it's a good reminder of how far they've gone. 
And being able to jump around from island to island also helps move the plot forward. Like, like when Dragon, who presumably is in the new world, sees Luffy's bounty, it starts to put a lot of questions into my brain. Like, when will they meet? What is Dragon planning? Same thing with like cutting to Blackbeard and Ace. What's gonna happen there? And I, I didn't even mention Aneru in space. Look, I thought that at the end of Skypiea, when Aneru was going to that infinite Vars, I thought that it was like a Team Rocket were blasting off again to situation like in Pokemon I didn't expect to actually see him land on the moon without like a spacesuit or anything furthermore there's also people on the moon and that's not explained either at least as far as I've read which is what I mean when I say that there are so many things that are answered but just like double the amount of things that were brought into question even though the arc is over this story has way more that it wants to tell and I am all in for it this doesn't make any sense. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> I hope any of what I've said in this entire review has made sense. I, my brain is melting. I'm going to go keep reading. Bye.